Welcome to the 20th Century History Series. All podcasts are released under a Creative Commons license and are free for non-commercial use. Each podcast is self-contained and does not require listening to previous episodes. The author is Kim Sonderborg, editor is Philip Bird, and the editor-in-chief is Dr. Liam Brown. All episodes are read by Kim Sonderborg. The Rise of Hitler For many people, the Third Reich, or Nazi state, stands as one of the great paradoxes of our time. In just 12 years, from 1933 to 1945, an educated, modern and cultured nation transformed into one of uniformed militarism, blind allegiance to a Führer and race-based hatred for other peoples. We will now analyze how Hitler and the National Socialists came into power and try to find out how Hitler was able to make National Socialism or Nazism appeal to the German people. Hitler and the Nazis' way into power can be divided into three phases. The first phase, from 1919 to 1923, saw the Nazi party as a revolutionary party. They planned to make a putsch, a transfer of power, to put themselves in charge of the country. During the second phase, from 1924 to 1933, Hitler used parliamentary tactics. The Nazis would try to gain power by winning elections, using the very democratic system they were out to destroy. And the third and final phase was that of legality, from Hitler's appointment to the chancellorship on January 30, 1933, to his elevation into the position of Führer of Germany in August 1934, where the Nazis used legal means, making laws, to consolidate Nazi power and get rid of the opposition. In each phase, Hitler showed remarkable abilities And the main historical argument has been whether he acted according to a predefined plan or simply had an uncanny knack for reading the times and the German people, changing his strategies to suit them. No matter what, Hitler's abilities as a politician, both as an orator, organizer and regarding his abilities to change strategies, put him in a very exclusive category of politicians. The first strategy of the Nazi party that of revolution during 1919 to 1923 was not very successful. It did not bring the party into power. However, these years were the formative years of the party itself, of its ideology, policies, leadership, and in regards to testing its relations to the surrounding German society. Germany in 1918 was in a chaotic state. In November 1918, Germany had been defeated after years fighting in World War I. Kaiser Wilhelm had been deposed and a new Weimar Republic, led by Social Democrat Friedrich Ebert, found it difficult to maintain order. Ebert had played a part in asking for peace in November 1918, resulting in the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans felt that the treaty punished them too harshly, taking away valuable land while at the same time demanding huge reparations. The government therefore had very little support for its moderate policies. People were extreme. On the extreme left wing of the political spectrum, the communists tried a revolution. And shortly afterwards, right-wing leader Dr. Wolfgang Kapp attempted the Kapp Putsch in Berlin. The right wing often consisted of soldiers who had returned from World War I. They band together in Freikorps, free corps units, which were under no central control and were angry and violent towards political opponents. A captain of one of the Freikorps by the name of Ernst Röhm would later transform his Freikorps unit into the Nazi Sturmabteilung, the SA. Hitler himself was a returned soldier who now worked as a political informant for the army. In 1919, he was sent to report on the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the German Workers' Party. He joined the party as number 55 and quickly became its star speaker. Hitler's political career had begun. In 1921, the DAP changed its name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party and laid their strategy clear. They wanted to take power in Germany through revolution. The National Socialists, or Nazis, criticized not just the Treaty of Versailles or the notion that the government had stabbed Germany in the back when signing it. 
They abhorred the entire democratic system. Their political program, called the 25-point program, was a mix of ideas with a little something for everyone. The German farmers should be recognized as the backbone of the German spirit. To work, to have a job, was a right which the state should guarantee its people. Jobs should go to the German citizens first. And no Jew could ever be a German citizen. It is curious to note that at this time the Jewish population of Germany comprised only 0.75% of the entire population. Many of the Nazi supporters had hardly ever seen a Jew. Hitler managed to combine the idea of mass appeal and mass politics from the socialists with the financial backing of the conservative industrialists. This is considered one of his main contributions to political theory. Hitler's ability to appeal to the masses was central in the growing support for the Nazi party. He was known as a brilliant speaker who was able to read his audience while speaking, telling them what they wanted to hear. Hitler would gradually whip up the crowd, creating an atmosphere aimed more at the heart than the mind. Anyone who disagreed was quickly removed by the stormtroopers or Sturmabteilung. Although the meetings were spectacular, Hitler's true appeal to the masses must be taken with a grain of salt until the 1930s when the party started winning elections. The revolutionary strategy was unsuccessful as it ended in the complete failure of the Munich Beer Hall Putsch on November 8, 1923. The putsch was planned not by Hitler and the Nazis, but by the leaders of the Bavarian state. Inspired by Mussolini's march on Rome in 1922, and the terrible German hyperinflation of 1922-23, the Bavarian leaders combined all the right-wing factions together and organized a putsch. The Nazis joined and took over. The putsch ended miserably the following morning on the 9th of November when state soldiers fired into the marching demonstration. Hitler was imprisoned and put on trial for treason. April 1924 marks the beginning of the next stage on Hitler's way towards power the democratic stage. As mentioned, Hitler was put on trial for treason, facing the death penalty, but he managed to use the witness stand as a political podium. The trial was publicized in all the German newspapers and Hitler found recognition for his criticisms of the Treaty of Versailles and the Weimar government. The Nazis became known all over Germany. Although Hitler faced the death penalty, it quickly became clear to him that the judge had national socialist leanings. Hitler was convicted for treason, but instead of the death penalty, he was sentenced to five years in prison with the possibility of parole after nine months. He spent the time writing his political manifesto, Mein Kampf, with the aid of his secretary, Rudolf Hess, who followed him into Landsberg prison. Originally titled, Four and a Half Years of Struggle Against Lies, Stupidity and Cowardice, Mein Kampf is a badly written, rambly collection of thoughts on history, race and politics mixed in with Hitler's personal philosophies. The notion of Aryan superiority formed the backbone of the Nazi ideology. The German Aryan race had become polluted by mixing with other races. Allowing other races, especially Jews, to interfere in German affairs had degraded the country to its present low state. After his release from Landsberg prison in 1925, Hitler set about rebuilding and reorganizing the NSDAP. Along with his oratory skills, Hitler's ability to redefine his party and his strategies in pursuit of his goals was one of his major strengths. The new strategy was no longer to try taking power by force, but through exploiting the very system they were out to destroy. Democracy. The strategy became to win elections. The Nazi party was reorganized to fit with the democratic image and abandoned the socialist principles in order to appeal more to the middle class. The SA was told to quieten down and from 1925 the SS or Schutzstaffel became Hitler's personal bodyguards, possibly as a protection against disgruntled SA thugs. Was National Socialist ideology successful? Not really. Mein Kampf was badly written and sold only 9,473 copies in its first year, and sales declined thereafter. It was not until 1933, when Hitler had already become Chancellor, that the book sold 1 million copies. Although this made Hitler a millionaire, Mein Kampf is considered one of the most bought but least read books in Germany. 
Redefining the party's strategy towards democratic means was also only partly successful. It would take years before the Nazis actually appealed to enough people. Initially, the new strategy and image of the NSDAP did not make a difference. In the December 1924 elections, the Nazis won only 3% of the votes, enough to send 14 members into the parliament, the Reichstag. In the election of 1928, the Nazis won a meager 2.6% of the votes. The Nazis were unsuccessful because what they offered was not in sync with what the population was now experiencing. From 1924 to 29, the Prime Minister of Germany was Gustav Stresemann, who took office when Friedrich Ebert had lost all confidence of the voters after the Ruhr invasion and hyperinflation of 1923. Stresemann replaced the worthless inflation marks with a new Rentenmark and was instrumental in negotiating the Dawes Plan, which secured Germany an American loan of 800 million gold marks. As a consequence, the Germans enjoyed an economic upturn while being able to meet reparation payments abroad. Few people now bothered with complaining about the Treaty of Versailles, and there were jobs for most people in the booming industry. With the Locarno Treaties in 1925, Germany agreed to secure its borders with France and Belgium. Germany was then invited to join the League of Nations in 1926 and was once again an international player. For a protest party, which had preached overturning the Treaty of Versailles and the destruction of democracy, the Nazis were being outdistanced by the flow of the times. They were unsuccessful during this parliamentary phase because their message did not suit the voters. People were smiling at the uniformed SA and making jokes about Hitler's gesticulations on the speaker's podium. Instead of going to political meetings, people went dancing. In Berlin alone, there were 900 dance bands. The chance for an audience came in 1930, and the NSDAP was very successful in exploiting it. In October 1929, the stock market on Wall Street in New York crashed, resulting in the Great Depression. The American loans to Germany were halted. Soon, the unemployment rate in Germany was 33%, the highest in Europe. All the old points of discontent came back to the surface. The Treaty of Versailles, the War Guild Clause, the small army, and so on. Hitler in particular blamed the Jews. The Jews were in charge of a worldwide conspiracy. The Jews were making money off of German misery, and on and on. Audience members at the Nazi meetings rose again, members joined the party, and more importantly, people voted for the Nazis. At their highest, in July 1932, the NSDAP received 37.8% of the vote, landing them 230 of the 608 seats in the Reichstag. The voters came from all spheres of society, each attracted to bits of the 25-point program. Or they came because they felt that the alternative options were worse. Many genuinely feared communism. Nobody wanted a hyperinflation like the one in 1923, which had deprived the middle class of their entire life savings. The rallying to a political solution or party solely from fearing that the alternatives are worse is called negative cohesion. It is doubtful whether the Nazis would have gathered their votes without it. But they were very successful in their election campaigns, which took place in the smallest of German towns. They enjoyed much visibility and had a well-oiled propaganda machine. Their overall success did, however, depend on the notion of crisis, and without the economic depression, it is doubtful whether people would have listened to them. And the NSDAP was successful, because it seemed that suddenly Hitler was in power appointed Chancellor by President Hindenburg himself. The appointment to Chancellor says much about Hitler's political courage, determination and skill in political manipulation. The short version is that President Hindenburg and Chancellor Bruning could not create a majority in the Reichstag without Hitler and the NSDAP. Bruning resigned in defeat and Franz von Papen, a civil servant, was appointed Chancellor. When the NSDAP in July 1932 received 37.8% of the votes, Hitler demanded the chancellorship. He was offered the vice-chancellorship, but refused. Still, von Papen could not create a majority and was replaced by Hindenburg with Kurt von Schleicher. Von Schleicher also could not create a majority, and finally Hindenburg had no other option than to appoint Hitler. 
Hitler was very successful in these manipulations, as he never lost sight of his goal, the full chancellorship or nothing. On the 30th of January 1933, Chancellor Hitler could begin the last stage of his ascent towards power, that of legality. Legality means when someone is able to extend and consolidate one's own power through legal means. Hitler and the NSDAP were extremely successful in this. Within 18 months, there was no organized opposition to them of any kind. The efficiency and thoroughness with which the National Socialists Nazified German society in all spheres and on all levels could be one of the most successful undertakings. It became possible through the Enabling Act of the 30th of March 1933. In March 1933, there was going to be an election. Hitler already had many votes, but he wanted a total majority in the Reichstag. Five days before the election, on the 28th of February, the Reichstag was set on fire. Hitler convinced Hindenburg that this was the work of communists. He persuaded Hindenburg to create a law for protection of the public during the election. This Reichstag fire decree made it possible for the Nazis to arrest anyone who was in opposition to them. Hitler then managed to extend the decree into an enabling act. This made it possible for him to create laws without the consent of the Reichstag. Hitler was now a dictator. The Nazis immediately began two policies. First, they simply made all other organizations illegal. There was no opposition or even alternatives to Nazi ideology. Then they extended this into the policy of Gleichschaltung, unifying in one direction, of the entire German society. Throughout 1933 and 1934, all organizations, unions and political parties which might unite in opposition to the Nazis were simply made illegal. Germany was now a one-party state. In society in general, National Socialists took over the central positions in all state and municipal governments and organizations. The police was headed by Heinrich Himmler, who was also in charge of the SS. In universities and schools, it became more important to be a good National Socialist than actually qualified for the job. It was overwhelming to the people because the Nazis immediately established National Socialist societies in all spheres of life to replace the ones that had been removed. New professional organizations such as the National Socialist Society of Teachers or Doctors or Lawyers or Journalists sprang up until German work life was completely Nazified. Newspaper, radio and all other media was brought in under the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda headed by Dr. Josef Goebbels. An issue of special importance to Hitler was the German Wehrmacht, the army. Hitler made every single soldier swear a personal oath of allegiance, not to Germany or the Constitution, but to himself as the Führer of Germany. This became a problem for Ernst Röhm, leader of the SA. Röhm had always believed that his SA would form the core of the new German army. On the 29th to 30th of June 1934, the Nazis carried out the Night of the Long Knives, where Röhm and other Nazis who had become troublesome were simply eliminated. Two events mark the culmination of Hitler's ascent into power. In August 1934, President Hindenburg died. The offices of President and Chancellor were combined into one, that of the Führer, who was now the undisputed leader of Germany. And in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws made it illegal for any Jews to hold important positions in Germany, while also creating a system for classification of who was a Jew and who was not. It seemed that Hitler's early ambitions for Mein Kampf had come to fruition. Germany was shredded of democracy, led by one single-minded Führer, and the arch-enemy Jew was to be excluded from German life. The Gleichschaltung was very successful, almost overwhelming. The Nazis were suddenly everywhere. In conclusion, we can see how Hitler and the NSDAP changed strategies three times during the 1920s and 1930s. The revolutionary strategy of 1919 to 1923 was a failure. The Nazis did not succeed in creating a national revolution. Hitler was tried for treason and sent to prison. 
The parliamentary phase of 1924 to 1933 was only successful when the Great Depression once again made life difficult for the Germans. Although the NSDAP had established itself on a national scale, they did not receive support during the good times of 1924 to 28. Only when the Depression destroyed the German economy did the population turn desperate enough to vote for radical solutions. When the chance came, though, Hitler and the NSDAP were quick to grab it and so well organized that the third strategy, that of complete Nazification of Germany, was carried out within a mere 18 months. The strategy of legality was very successful. The voters never knew what hit them. This concludes this episode of the 20th Century Histories series podcast. Music for the intro and outro was made by Andrea LaRose, while the music in this episode was made by Border Run. To download more of these podcasts or to leave a comment, please visit www.historypodcast.net. Thank you for listening. <laughs>